Hi everybody, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis, and in this video we're going to talk about extracting data for a three-level meta-analysis. And this is going to be particularly a case where we're using correlated and hierarchical effects and robust variance estimation. So what the main difference is going to be here between the conventional and three-level analysis that we're looking at is in the conventional analysis we could only count participants once, but we don't have that restriction in the three-level model because we can account for dependencies in the data. So we're going to take a look at what that actually means in practice. So I've got this study pulled up here from ResearchGate and I will just highlight over this here. So uh, we're going to copy, the first thing just like before is we're going to copy down some information for our our descriptive statistics or descriptive uh, analysis for the, for the study. So I'm just going to close that other file so I don't uh, get confused here as we go clicking. So our first study is going to be Dinser and Dagene, I believe it is written as. I hope I spelled that right. Okay, wonderful. And this article is from 2017 from what I recall. Okay. Oh, it's actually 2015. I need to fix that. And this is why it's so important to make sure these details are correct, right? Because I've read this study and coded this study for a number of different meta-analyses over the years, and I still got it wrong off of memory. So always make sure you're double checking these things. So as before, the data that we're interested in for this particular coding form, oh, I forgot the publication type, journal article, uh, for this particular coding form is all based on the method section of the manuscript. So I actually really like this uh, Google Scholar Reader add-on for Chrome, because um, one of the nice things, it shows you the menu over here and you can just click on it. So. Um, for our purposes today, we're actually not going to go through and code this super, super accurately because I don't want to have to try and go through and parse all the details of this study. But one of the things that I want to point out, because it's important here and it's why I chose this example, is because we have three experimental groups and one control group, right? So that means we're going to have multiple comparisons of that same control group. Okay, so let's scroll down here. and. I want us to look first at our pre and post test scores because we know this is what we're going to want in the end, right? So we can see we have group one, group two, group three, and a control. So let's take a look at our coding form. What do we have here? Well, first of all, we know we have three different groups that we're going to compare to our control group. So I'm going to add those in here. Now, something I need to add is I need to add one column to the left, and this is going to be our comparison. And what I do in this column is I actually write down which groups I'm comparing. And the reason is because it makes it so much easier to check my data later. Okay, so I'm gonna put uh, group one versus control, group two versus control, and group three versus control. Okay, and we know that's gonna be 2015 and 2015. And we know that these are journal articles Okay, so you can already see how this is so different than, I spelled this wrong, it's gonna bother me even though it's an example. Okay, so you can already see how this is so different from a conventional analysis, right? Because we already have three lines here for one study and we are comparing all to the same control group and this would be a major do not go, like do not do this in a conventional meta-analysis. It violates the assumptions of a conventional meta-analysis. But as I mentioned, three-level meta-analysis, we can account for these dependencies statistically, so it's going to be okay. Okay, so in terms of the agent's form, its gender, its age, its role, etc., I'm actually not going to fill these in right now, um, mostly because I don't think you guys want to sit here and watch me go through the method section of this paper to actually find it. I find that most of what people are interested in is how do we actually get this outcome data recorded in a way that's going to be useful for us. So down here, you can see that we have three different final tests, right? We have our final knowledge test, our final skill test, and our final literacy test. Hmm, what does that mean, right? When we look at our coding form, what does that mean? We're only set up for one test. Well, if we're interested in learning, we may actually end up needing to make a lot more rows for this study, okay? So let's see what these tests were. We have knowledge, skill, and literacy. Um, now, one thing I want to say, in case you guys go and decide to code this study on your own, I may be remembering wrong because I didn't I didn't read this before I started filming this video, um, but 
some studies like this, the knowledge test and skill exam, for example, may be a part of the literacy test. And if that were the case, I would not end up coding all three of these. But for our purposes in this example, I am going to pretend like these are completely independent tests, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna make separate rows for the knowledge test, the skill exam, and the literacy test. So we're gonna go up here, and I'm just going to add more of a descriptor. I'm just gonna say knowledge test. So that way, in the future, when future Noah comes back to try and figure out what future Noah did, we can see really easily what we did. So what I'm gonna do is just copy paste, and I'm gonna change this to the next one with skill. Okay. And then we're gonna copy paste one more time. And the last one was a literacy test. All right, and if you watch the conventional meta-analysis video, chances are you know where we're going next. <laughs> we are gonna go straight to the outcome results. Um, and we're gonna write this down. So first of all, we know we only have one control group, so we can just write the sample size for all of them, and it's 30, they tell us right here, n equals 30. So I'm just going to put 30 three times. I'm gonna copy it, then I know I had three tests, so that will get us that information there. Now, I had a experimental group one, two, three, one, two, three. So we're gonna have 35, 31, 31. 35, 31, 31. And again, I'm just gonna copy this because I know I kept it in the same order. Wonderful, okay. Now comes the part that gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're gonna do the control group first because that's gonna be the easiest for us here. So we're gonna start here. We're gonna start this final knowledge test. So we have 79.84 as our mean. And our standard deviation was 9.33. Okay, and we're gonna copy. Now we move on to the next test, which was down here. Final skill exam, so we have 74 and 1248. 74, whoops, 74 and 12.48. Okay, so here's something I wanna point out. You guys saw me make that typo, right? And I'm not gonna edit this out because that is a very human thing to do. A lot of times we put in the wrong number on accident, especially when we're trying to remember a couple different numbers at once. So something that I do is after I put in every single number, I double check it visually to make sure it is what I thought it should be, right? So you heard me really quickly say, oh, that's not right. And it's because I type in that number and then I'm looking at it to make sure it's what I actually meant to type. So the other thing that I tend to do is after I get this recorded and I go back, I tend to make sure that these numbers are correct before I move on to the next one. Uh, so then we're down to the third test now. And I'm, I'm not, saying this out loud, but I'm going to for the purposes now. So you can see I still have this highlighted. The reason I have this highlighted is so I can visually check it again before I move on to the next one. So my last one is right here. I have 77.50 and 9.86. So you have 77.50 and 9.86. And we're just gonna copy this and drop these down into here. Okay, so now we have our control group all coded. So now what we need to do is get our other groups included here. So what I like to do is go straight down the line. I find this easier for me to go vertically than it is for me to go horizontally. I don't know why. You're welcome to do it either way. It doesn't make any tangible difference. It's just the way that I like to code. So I'm going to say 81.86 and 11.95. 81.86 and 11.95. That was our first one. Now what you have to remember is I'm sticking with group one. So that means I got to drop down three to get at the next group one row. I'm gonna make sure my numbers are correct, 8186, 1195, wonderful. And we're gonna to move to the next one, which is 7529 and 1206. All right, we're gonna move down to the next one, 7923 and 1129. Okay, so, you can see how this process works, right? All we do is we go through and we extract that data from that table and we move it into here. Now, something to keep track of as you're going through encoding these moderators is to make sure that the moderator is correct according to each individual comparison. So you can see here we have group one compared to a control group. That means all of this information 
uh, for the way I've structured my coding form anyway, should be in relation to, to experimental group one. Similarly, in the next one, this should all be in relation to experimental group two, and the next one should be in relation to experimental group three. So that's just something that I wanted to point out is these rows are likely to be different. Okay, they're not gonna be the same as we go through with coding. So that pretty much brings us up to speed. As we are continuing down here, um, as I just wanna point out a couple things that are kind of unique. Okay, so first and foremost, for a three-level meta-analysis, you need to keep the study the same if it's from the same study. What I mean by that is don't add an A, don't add a B, don't add a C, any of that stuff if it's all the same paper. So this is all from the same paper in my case, so they are all going to stay the same. Now, if I have the next paper, let's say it's by the same authors, um, but it's their 2017 paper, it would look like that. Okay. The only reason we would add an A or a B or anything like that to this column in a three-level analysis is if it were a different paper published in the same year. Okay. Last but not least, we have this effect size number column. This is just going to be sequential. So if you end up with 79 studies, this should be 1 through 79. So what I tend to do is I just wait till the end and I do this column very last. Um, and that brings us through everything for the three-level meta-analysis and coding it. So hopefully you can see what the differences are here for coding a three-level analysis. Um, of course, there's a lot of different options for how you can do this. Uh, this is just the way that I have done it in the past with what I just showed you the example of. Um, so I hope that you find this helpful, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.